You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. It has been an insane weekend. We had the big kayak fishing show at Jake's Bait and Tackle, which is an absolutely huge success, as you can tell. I'm still recovering from my walking pneumonia. Uh, I was starting to feel better Saturday. Then I decided to fish a bass tournament when it was negative six outside. It was so cold. The bottom of the boat was frozen, and I couldn't put the boat plug in. And uh, that was kind of important. So I had to go buy... uh, some like antifreeze stuff that you put on your windshield wipers and pour it down into the boat, into the live well to get that thing unclogged so I could put the plug in. Then I had to go put it in the water and then aerate it out so we wouldn't kill any fish. We didn't have to worry about that because we didn't catch shit. So it didn't matter at that point. So that was a fun start to the tournament season. Uh, anywho, with that, a uh, couple of little housekeeping things. We have our winners picked for our photo contest for February. That will be uploaded to the Patreon tomorrow morning along with our Patreon supporter of the week. Now, uh, we're starting to branch out into all the other fun bodies of water around Virginia, Maryland, and the DMV area since it's springtime, baby. Believe it or not, we're hitting 60-degree weather. Spring is coming here. And we have uh, one of the guys that really helped us break down the... A really cool river, one of the oldest rivers in the world, a place that really no one talks about, which was the new river system. Uh, We have Ethan Stone here. And so big round of applause. I'm just going to bring this guy in. Ethan, how are you doing, sir? Good. Thanks for having me. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming back on. I really appreciate it. I know that you're insanely busy right now. Yeah. Yeah, getting busy. Um, We kind of start guide trips the first week of March. This time of year, I'm out just about every day, kind of getting ready, you know, following the fish from day to day, kind of. So I'm all ready to go here when I start doing my first few trips. If people aren't aware because they didn't watch the last episode or haven't even gotten to know you yet. Uh, so a quick little back history is probably important. Uh, where, How did you get into all this guiding stuff? Um, well, I'm originally from Charlottesville, Virginia, but I came down here to Blacksburg for school at Tech and I started guiding on the New River. I was fortunate enough to get hooked up with Britt Stoudemire, who owns New River Outdoor Company. He's honestly just kind of like a pioneer in river smallmouth fishing in general. And uh, been doing it ever since. This will be like my seventh year guiding. I'm like the lead guide now. So just a lot of days on the water, a lot of following fish. And I love it, you know, because I mean, I just feel like every year I come into the year kind of with more knowledge and more confidence and just I think I told you last time, it's like a big jigsaw puzzle. And every year I feel like I have a few more pieces to it, you know. It it is really crazy, like how you can live on basically one body of water so long and you can still learn new stuff every single time. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And I mean, we cover about 70 miles of river with regularity. So just kind of it's a lot of water to cover. And yeah. How do you predominantly do that? Up in this area, the Shenandoah, Upper Potomac, Susquehanna, it's a lot of jet boaters and kayaks, pretty much. What vessel are you using? Um, I'm out of a 16-foot Moravia raft, like a fishing raft. It's a really nice boat. The new kind of has bigger rapids and more rapids than both those bodies of water, so it kind of limits where the jet boaters can go. I mean, there still are a lot of people that fish a jet boat. But usually the jet boaters are kind of held to like one pool, kind of, you know, maybe they'll be able to put in at a ramp and go a couple miles up or a couple miles down. But, you know, with the raft, you can make like long seven, eight mile floats going through kind of multiple class two, class three rapids and kind of hit all the areas that some people might not be able to. That's really important on a river like the new. I I think for people up here, I'm not going to be able to do it justice, but it's a wild place. I had on... um, this episode hasn't dropped yet, but I talked to uh, Trey Leash, who runs uh, Innovative Sportsman. He went down to the New River for the Hobie thing, and he's like, dude, this is not like any other river. It's like, it's freaking dangerous and wild. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it definitely you need to know what you're getting into. Um, you know, research your floats before you do it. Kind of know your flow levels. You know, it it's, can be treacherous. 
And then, as always, guys, uh, later in the show, ask a question, win a prize. It's how all these Monday Night Lives work. Ask a good question to our host here. And then if I if I think it's worth it, it's going to win a prize. Jake's bait and tackle. So you guys know the drill. <sighs> this time of year is so interesting because the sp spring in going from Winchester, Virginia, down to the New River, just because the calendar is starting to say March doesn't mean it's necessarily hitting into that spring vibe everywhere. Yeah. Right now, where would you say the New River is? Um, I'd say they're still kind of doing their winter stuff right now. And I mean, honestly, I expect that to probably change in the next 14 days. Um, wow. I see a lot of people like across the country, kind of they catch like their biggest fish of the year in January and February. And that hasn't really been what I've experienced in the new, the new, I mean, the last two years, it's fished great in February, just because of kind of the winters have been so mild the last couple of years. But I always kind of notice usually right around the first or second week of March that the the great, great big fish start showing up, you know. I mean, we've caught a couple, a few fish over 20 inches this year. I mean, we caught last week. I went out on kind of a two-day trip, and we caught like 35 each day, and it was like three-pounder, three-and-a-half, three-and-three-quarter, 4.1, you know, just a lot of really nice fish. But I expect to start seeing the first, like, five plus pounders here in the next couple of weeks. I was kind of looking back on my records from last year and the first five pounder we caught last year after I fished like 20 days in February, the first five pounder was March 5th. And then I caught another one on March 6th and another one on March 7th. So like, it seems like when it turns on, like it's on, you know, the Hobie was there last year and I, I hyped the shit out of that because I thought that it's going to just be insane weights. And guys, I was wrong as shit. Like, what happened there? Or because I really thought somebody would tag a monster uh, during the event or a couple. Uh, and I, just wrong time of year? Um, So July, you know, you're never going to catch as many big fish in July as you would in like the spring. Um, that being said, July can be good under correct circumstances. It was kind of like a just a few errors going on. It was so hot that week that, you know, the whole flow of the river is controlled by a hydroelectric dam. And it was so hot and there was so much power consumption that they started taking the water up and down and up and down and up and down because that's how they can generate the most power. And that is really bad for the fishing because they're getting pulled up and backed off and pulled up and backed off. And I think it was hard for a lot of the anglers because there would be like a foot and a half difference in water level from day to day or throughout the day. You know, I think these guys, like some of them in practice, thought they found a good spot. And then they came back during the tournament and they'd cut the dam on and they couldn't even hold their kayak where they'd been fishing, you know, the day before. So I just think kind of a combination of weather, time of year, and that release from the dam made it hard on a lot of people. That is actually a really good thing. I forgot to bring up, and I apologize. So if you guys don't know of the New River, because I, I feel like a lot of people that might be listening right now, because we already got, let's see, on Instagram, we got 20, no, we got eight on Instagram, and we got 28 on Facebook and YouTube. So you guys are finally trickling in. Sorry, I was so late uh, uploading this link. Um, the New River is actually split between a major lake. You know, it's so... Would you consider the new river the, the primary new river? Is that above or below Clater Lake? Well, people fish both of them. Our guide service is below Clater Lake, which okay. is confusing because that means north of Clater Lake because the new river flows south to north. So we're we fish like the 70 miles of river from the Clater Lake Dam to the West Virginia state border. And uh, I know a lot of people that do well upstream of the lake. It's a lot bigger of a river system downstream of the lake, like a lot more water, you know, more habitat, you know, more kind of biomass. So I, I tend to think that the bigger fish are, are down below the lake where, where we are, but I, I see a lot of people do really well up above the lake as well. I would can, you know, I grew up fishing the Shenandoah river a lot. Really? Above the lake. Yeah, in Charlottesville, I'd go over there oh. quite a bit. But uh, above the lake reminds me a lot of the Shenandoah River, whereas below the lake is a lot bigger than the Shenandoah. And, and yeah. What's the biggest smallmouth you caught out of the Shenandoah way back when? I mean, I was like in high school when we'd fish it. I mean, we'd catch a few 18 or 20 inches. I remember always catching really big largemouth, like six, seven pound largemouth up out of there. 
Seriously? Yep. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yep. How the hell does a largemouth get that big in a river system like that? Like what? Did, I don't know. I don't know. We don't really have them on the new. Um, I think I the musky kind of. There's a lot more musky in the new than the Shenandoah, and I think the musky kind of they don't eat the largemouth, but they eat the same thing as the largemouth. Kind of crowd them out, you know. I, I think that's a really good thing to talk about too. Is like musky, generally speaking, I don't think would target a largemouth compared to what they eat. Because I, I was go because I'm a nerd uh, talking about studies about the river system and about bluegill. Or, or sunfish, uh, my apologies, and how when the muskie and the flathead really got into the new, you saw in certain sections that the largemouth population did just completely vanish, and the sunfish did too. Is that something anecdotally yeah. you've seen? Well, that's kind of before my time that I've been fishing the new, but I think they really started ramping up the muskie stockings around like 2000. And I talked to a lot of people here that said the largemouth fishing in certain slower areas of the river around here used to be really good. And then it kind of has like kind of the as the musky numbers have gone up, they've seen a decline in the largemouth numbers. And a lot of the people that say the largemouth fishing used to be really good say that the best largemouth fishing was now in the spots where most people go musky fishing. You know, so hmm. I think kind of in a river system, largemouth and musky kind of share the same habitat you know they like those slower pools where they can get out of the current whereas musky probably don't have as much of an effect on smallmouth because smallmouth you know like being in a lot of current usually were you what was your experience with musky before you got on down to the new river no, i'd never caught one kind of non-existent really <laughs> and now well i went out one day last week and caught four of them you know so there's a lot of them on the new there's Right now, there's a lot of about 25 inches, like kind of baby ones, but wow. uh, just enough to to tear up my mega bass jerk bait and make me upset. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's so weird because I feel like that river is. I feel I personally think it's a coin toss between what is the more popular fish. Is it the muskie or the smallmouth? But I'm not a local. Like, would you consider? more people talk about the muskie or is it or is it about the smallmouth fishing down there um i think the department of wildlife resources did like a survey and it was like 60 40 or 70 30 in favor for smallmouth but uh you know smallmouth will always be just kind of easier you know if you're the guy that goes out on memorial day weekend and fourth of july weekend you know you probably don't have the gear to fish for muskie you know that's also so, true yeah hmm. Yeah, that's actually that's a valid point. Um, turning to this this time of year and, and kind of the tactics, do with your experience on the new and the Shenandoah, are, are smallmouth pretty much do they act the same on any river system, or are the smallmouth uniquely different on the new because of its its topography and how it just the water flows through it? Um, they're different on every river system. I mean, it's like anything; they all share similar characteristics, but you know, they're different on any river system. I fished last week at the James river for one day and, uh, kind of came back to the new river and was just surprised at kind of how differently the fish were setting up, you know, how kind of differently fish do things on each river. You know, I fished a ton of rivers in the Southeast here now in Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and each river seems like, you know, there's a few key principles that kind of hold river smallmouth fishing together, but then each river kind of has its own personality, it seems like. And me and Britt, who owns the outfit, we always joke that the new just has so much personality. It's just so kind of different than a lot of other rivers that, that we fish. Well, with all of your you know exploration all over the country, what sticks out to you, some differences you see? And then we'll bring it back to the new river. Oh, the new river. I mean, it just has really big fish. I mean, so like one day, a couple weeks ago, we went up the James river and caught close to 40 fish and, uh, nothing huge. I mean, a bunch of really nice, like three, three and a half pounders, you know, the next day I came back to the new river. The first fish I caught was 21 inches and four and a half pounds. So it just like, just the new river, your ratio of big fish per fish caught is just incredible, I think. But I think one thing that makes it hard to fish is there are so many good spots. It's just such <laughs> incredible habitat for these smallmouth. Um, 
you know, it's just in in other rivers, you see a good spot. Like if you find a honey hole in the wintertime on the James River, the Shenandoah, you know, people just catch them one after another out of those spots, you know, like they're just stacked in there. And the new river just has so much good habitat for them, especially good wintering habitat that they don't get, you know, 30, 40 fish deep in those spots. You know, Hmm. there's usually only like a handful of fish per spot this time of year in the new river, but they tend to be like really nice fish, you know? So the big thing is, is people keep piling in here. Um, uh, on different rivers like the James, the Shenandoah, I guess smallerish rivers when it comes to width and size, they're going to stack up more in certain key areas, whereas the new, it's spread out. So you have two or three fish, not 30 or 40. That would be the biggest yeah. difference you've seen. Yeah. Yep. But the kind of the inverse of that is on smaller rivers in the wintertime, you could go for huge stretches without catching a fish, you know, because like there's no good wintering area, you know. But on the new, you're like never that far from a good wintering spot, you know, it seems like. You know, I'll, I'll bring it back to largemouth fishing. I mean, like, you know, when you see videos of like the elites fishing like in like Texas or something and like the whole lake is flooded timber, you know, and you're like, oh, my gosh, everything looks so good. But mm-hmm. they're not necessarily catching like a million fish, you know. I'd say the new is similar to that in smallmouth. There's such an abundance of good cover that it's not like every single good looking piece of cover will have a bass on it you know that makes your job way harder yeah you kind of got to know the spots within the spots um yeah but you know and that i say that about the winter time but i mean in the pre-spawn when it's on the fish i mean they're really easy to pattern i mean if you if you know what you're looking for in terms of the amount of current you know, depth of the eddy, you know, it seems like you can just run spot after spot after spot and really get them. I heard this interesting thing over the weekend, which was the Susquehanna is uh, a foot deep and a mile wide. And then the new river is a mile deep and a foot <laughs> wide. It, yeah. And I thought about that. It It is apt that that place, it rips current and it's got some really deep spots compared to a lot of rivers. I don't think people appreciate that that go down there. Yeah. Yeah, no, there are some really, really deep holes on the river. Um, it, yeah, and there it is a lot of current. That's one thing when I started fishing the new that kind of really, I mean, it is a lot of current, even though, even when the water's not very high, it just, it is always moving. And so when I fish the Shenandoah or the Upper Potomac, I'm using like a, a 136th ounce head on my, uh, on my Ned rig or tube, something really light. If someone's going to come down there, like what's the lightest you start with? Because I'm assuming, generally speaking, if they're pulling water from the lake, that current is going to be way faster than any uh, people experience. I mean, in the summer when the flows are low, I hardly ever go below a 10th ounce Ned Rig, you know. This time of year when the flows are high and we're fishing jigs, you know, I mean, I I was going to get this to show you later. I mean, I've been doing well on like a 3 8 ounce tungsten jig. You know, wow. I was throwing a half ounce tungsten jig a few weeks ago when the water was high. Um, yeah, I usually go like quarter or three eighth ounce on a jig. And then kind of in the summer when the flows are lower, I'm, I go with the 10th sometimes, but usually I go with that one sixth net rig. You know, I mean, it, you, it always takes something to get to the bottom there on the new river. Well, I guess we get this is the uh, the first question of the night uh, from Marcus. You just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Please uh, email me, fishingthedmv at gmail.com. You can check me out on Instagram, Facebook. Just message me so I can give it to you. Caught them down there yesterday on a little a little bit of everything, swim bait, negro, crank crankbait. So basically, we're going to use this as the segue question here. I don't um, believe that for a second. I know Marcus, <laughs> and there's no way he caught, <laughs> caught at least three fish. If he says he caught them on three baits, that means he has to have caught at least three. So I have my doubts, but we'll see. Oh, dagger. Uh, <laughs> so what are your baits then this time of year? Um, This time of year, I mean, like I was saying, like it's going to flip like a switch here soon from like winter bite to pre-spawn bite. You know, I've already, already kind of seen signs like the last few days I've been fishing. It's been like kind of like a winter bite. And then the last two hours of sunlight, they'll like really break loose, you know, when that water's the hottest in the afternoon. But uh, kind of my winter baits that I was kind of already showing them off. Like I like throwing a 
see if I could get it in front of my camera. Like throwing a tube. I throw a lot of tubes. Other know. way. There you go. <laughs> tube. You know, this is just a little two and three quarter ounce. I really like throwing the little ones. They always seem to get it done. Hmm. And uh, I also throw like a football jig. Really like throwing a football jig in the winter. The thing about like the tube versus the football jig is if I break this off, it's like five dollars, you know, whereas if I break the tube off, it's like one dollar. But yeah, I've really, really been liking this football jig with just like a little baby rage crawl has done good for me this winter. Um, kind of breaking into my box here. I mean, this past Friday was just all about a jerk bait, you know. I mean, everybody knows the deal with that, you know, just like a vision 110 type jerk bait i always do really well on um kind of for the winter bite you know i really like cranking too i throw a ton of these rock crawlers always do well in the winter you know Something really like this oh yeah and then last year i had uh my biggest smallmouth ever out of the river i caught it on just like a little uh flat side crankbait like this like a spro style these do really well for me um so just i'd say probably 90 percent of what i'm throwing in the winter is a jig a jerk bait or a crank bait um am i making a lot of noise no uh, it's musky just Logan, magnet yeah logan reynolds oh, in the chat uh, vision 110 equals musky magnet <laughs> oh yeah no i i bought like four or five of them today and texted our good friend nolan and he's like oh man those muskies are gonna eat well so yeah that's always always fun when you have nine treble hooks in a muskie but uh honestly last week i was really breaking loose at the end of the day on you know the old tried and true i was about like, to bring that up <laughs> yeah. I, I was creeping on your social uh, media yeah. yeah oh man that people don't know that'll do major damage on a small mouth but it's so weird because it seems like the Susqu with the base that you listed, the Susquehanna and the New River, uh, they lend themselves to power fishing those bigger base, generally speaking. Whereas mm -hmm. it seems like the Upper Potomac, the Shenandoah, maybe a little bit of the James, it just seems, is the Forge just smaller there compared to the New and the Susky? Um, I mean, it might be, you know, we have nobody ever, people get their mind blown. The crawfish in the New River are giant. I mean, they're like the size of your hand. Like, I mean, from like the tip of your middle finger to your wrist. I mean, they're like five or six inches long. So, I mean, I think those just giant crawfish. And then we do have, uh, you know, some bait fish forage, like gizzard shad type forage. Yeah, I think there is big forage on the new. But uh, I think this time of year, they're just so keen in on gaining go. weight. You know, I mean, I... I think a lot of fish, a lot of big fish gain like three quarters of a pound, you know, in the month of March and early April. So I think a lot of people miss this opportunity to uh, power fish because uh, they That's just, insane. they're so used to finesse fishing doing well, but fish, they want to eat and they want to eat big this time of year. That's absolutely insane. And then for people that are listening to the re-upload on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, I'm, I'm showing a picture of a crawfish right now. And it looks like a damn lobster. There is nothing like that on the Shenandoah or the Upper Potomac. That thing is, that's insane how big that thing is. Good Lord. Yeah, they're, uh, they're giant, giant. With that said, we do have a question up here, if I can find it again. You guys are really pouring them in, and I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Right, hold on, get back up to it. It was a glide bait question. Where the heck was it? Yeah, Justin Marsh. Uh, Justin Marsh, uh, is a big glide bait out of the question now on the New River? Uh, Justin, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle? Yeah, message me, and you can get it. No, not at all. Um, I have a lot of clients that like throwing glide baits. I personally have never gotten into it too much and honestly we keep going back to it but it's because of the musky i'm not, <laughs> like i can't spend point. the money on a bait that's either going to get broken off or you know absolutely torn up because i mean even when you don't break the bait off the pain is done and just it looks terrible you know so uh that's kind of why i've never gotten into glide bait fishing i have a few clients that love glide bait fishing and they fish theirs all the time and uh We've caught some really nice fish on it and we have lost some baits to muskie. So it, are they that 
thick in there compared to the other rivers around here, like the Upper James and places you like know, that? The wow. Department of Wildlife Resources did a study and they said that the Shenandoah has, I think they said like 0 0.08 mature muskie per mile. And they said the James had 1.1 mature muskie per mile. And I think that was 38 inches or bigger was their criteria. They said the new had 3.4 mature muskie per mile. Holy yeah. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus, man. No wonder so many people go down there for that stuff. Wow. Mm-hmm. How are there any big smallmouth left? That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, they, like I said, they tend to kind of stick to different areas. And, uh, usually if I catch a big muskie, I just move on because usually there won't be a smallmouth there. I've like very, very rarely either caught a smallmouth first and then caught a muskie in the same spot or caught a muskie first and then caught a smallmouth. Usually it's one or the other are sitting in, in the spot. You know. Do this musky rotate? So example is uh, you have a good eddy, you, you've had success there all week, and then you go there, all of a sudden there's a musky there. Does that tend to happen or is it pretty much the same area? I think musky do kind of, from what I've heard, I'm no musky expert, but from what I've heard, they have like their home spots and it might be more than like one eddy, but they really, I mean, they have a few spots that they really like to hold in. We got a couple more questions here. We got a really good one here. I'm gonna get back up to it. Uh, bucktail fishing. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna make this one. You just, I think you just want a gift card for this question here. That is a uh, good question. Yep. Yeah. How do you judge the current in a particular spot? To me, too fast, and you pass it by. So, in the winter time, you are either looking for an eddy, so out of the current, or you're looking for just a slow, gradual flow. Um, so. I'm not looking at any fast current spots this time of year. The farther the spring goes along, the kind of the more and more I'm willing to fish kind of areas with a lot of current. And then by the summertime, the fish like being in the fast current because it's the coolest water and the most oxygenated water. Um, so you just kind of have to judge, you know, based on the weather conditions, what time of year it is, the water level, you know, if the water is really, really high, they're going to try to get out of the current throughout the year. I mean, if it's a really high flowing river, they're going to try to get in the eddies. But uh, kind of like in the late summer, they really like being in some of the faster water because it's the coolest and most oxygenated. Um, my best answer to that question would be, as you're fishing, really be cognizant of the speed of the current on where you're catching your fish and focus on areas of similar speed. Like I doubt on the same day you'll catch a fish out of a dead slow eddy and then catch one in a really fast current spot, you know, mm. just kind of try to key in on the speed of the current you're catching your fish at and fish similar areas. And we got, an, we got another one from Steven Lloyd fishing. Uh, how is the fishing around Radford slash Virginia tech area? Um, I mean, I live in Blacksburg, which is where Virginia tech is and, it's good. <laughs> a lot of good fishing around. Um, yeah, a lot of good fishing all through the town of Radford. Like one of the floats we do is just right through downtown Radford. And that's always that's been cool. a really consistent one for us. Yeah. Smallmouth, it seems like when I look at them and pictures from Lake Erie, the Shenandoah Susky, they're all built uniquely Ohio. They're different. They're built different. How would you describe the smallmouth, just the way they look in the new compared to other rivers? Um, so I went up to Lake Erie last year and oh, caught cool. some of those footballs. I caught a six pound, 10 ouncer, um, but it was only just over 21 inches. And, uh, in comparison, my biggest fish on the new river was 23 inches and it was, uh, only about six pounds, two ounces. So, I mean, Dang. that'll give you a, a, a kind of insight. You know, the Erie fish was two inches shorter an eight pound or eight ounces heavier. Holy Christ. heavier. So, uh, I, I mean, I still like, I mean, we use throughout the years, I've caught a handful of 23 plus inch fish out of the new, and you don't hear about people catching them that long up North, you know, I mean, obviously you hear about them. And if you do hear about a 23 incher up North, it's weighing like eight and a half pounds, you know? Um, 
So, I mean, I think they just kind of – they can get longer down here, I think, because the growing season is longer. Um, and I think they can get older here than they can up north. But uh, they have just kind of that more average build than like a really stocky build like the ones up north. That's interesting. I never even thought of that before. Before I get to my question, I'm going to make sure I get to uh, the audience's questions. Again, guys, ask, ask a good question, uh, and you can win a prize. Uh, again, now, if I ask your question, that doesn't mean automatically you win a prize. I had that last week. I, I'll let you guys know if you won or not. Um, uh, with that said, Greg just won a prize. Uh, do you use bucktails, uh, any top water for musky? Um, I want to add to this one a little bit. Hair jigs are really big for smallmouth up here, especially on the upper Potomac Shenandoah area. Do you get a lot of, of hair jig fishing? four fit a small mouth on the new i've tried it in the winter time and i've had decent luck on it um just a few times i i've never like been blown away like oh man this is doing way better than like a jig would but i've caught a few fish on it here as far as musky go um i have never tried throwing a bucktail for musky i know a lot of people throw top water a lot of people throw big plugs big balsa plugs big tube jigs all that um top water for sure but uh no i've never tried using a bucktail is it true back in the days for musky anglers they used to use live guinea pigs in harnesses oh, I, I don't know okay. i think i've heard that yeah <laughs> no a lot of people will use like a big creek chub in a harness or a lot of people buy trout trout from yep. private trout hatcheries and use them in a harness but uh yeah the guinea pig that'd be a little cruel yeah, that, that'd be cruel. But I just like I, I heard the rumor and I had to ask a guy down there because that is kind of like the musky mecca as well. Um, we got another really great question here. Or actually, a statement. I know my wife is going to kill me for saying it's a question. It's a statement. Been fishing with N NROC for many years, and we've never not encountered multiple musky per trip. That's freaking awesome. And then there's this other person. I don't know what the, they have to be related to you. Let me pull this up here. Uh, hey, from Manchester, England, brothers. So that's awesome. We have somebody watching all the way from England. Um, I don't know anybody from England. Well, then thank you for enjoying fishing <laughs> the DMV. Uh, <laughs> um, my, my next question for you is, do they spawn at a different water temperature comparatively to fish on the upper James due to the fact that they're below a dam where if I'm not mistaken, Claytor Lake is going to be pulling water from the bottom. So that yeah. means it's going to always be colder, correct? It usually is always colder than the other rivers. Um, I would say they spawn a little bit later. This is kind of against what a lot of people think. I've just noticed on the new that they spawn more in accordance to like a calendar date than they do to the water temperature, which a lot of people would be like, what? That's crazy. But I have just noticed a huge, huge wave of spawn always happens on the full moon, either at the end of April or the first of May. And it can be like the warmest or the coldest year ever up to that point. And still that kind of April, May turn, usually near full moon is when a lot of fish start spawning. I think it has to do with the moon. And then I think they take a lot of cues from the length of day. Like the photo period is the word for that. I think that length of day is like an indicator to them when to start spawning just as much as the water temperature. I mean, you kind of hit on it, but how much, if I ask people this question, I feel like everyone gives me a different response. So I think it's a fascinating question. How much of it is, the, how much do you believe in moon phase and daylight comparatively to temperature to cue fish into spring is here? I would say I used to be a temperature person and now I'm like a big length of day person. I think the moon matters a lot for spawning. I don't know how much the moon phase matters in them kind of coming out of their winter holes to their pre-spawn areas. I think the full moon is definitely a cue for them to spawn. Um, but I think length of day plays a huge impact on it. Like, I mean, I was out last week and it was, it was 46, you know, which is pretty darn warm water for this time of year here. And I mean, they were still kind of in their wintering areas. Whereas, you know, today's February 26th. If it was March 26th and the water temperature was still 46 degrees, 
they would be in totally different areas. They'd be up shallow, you know, in a lot different, more different areas than they are right now. That's interesting. You know, I, I think it's a, and also in the river, you always, always have to be cognizant of level. You know, that's a variable you don't have at all in lake fishing. I mean, the fish are not going to try to spawn when the water's super high for the most part. So I've seen years where the water has been high for the whole month of April and the whole month of May. And you're kind of like, I wonder if we just kind of missed the spawn this year. And then as soon as it levels out in June, the fish are like, they're there spawning. So level, length of day, and then temperature. But I'd say temperature is is secondary to, to time of year and level of the river. We've seen a bunch on the Shenandoah in particular, where you had two years, chat, you can help me out here. I think it's 2018 and 19, you had blowout, you had just absolute blowout right during the spawn. Mm -hmm. Because you have a dam there, does that actually help keep the, the flow rate or the, the water levels pretty consistent comparatively if that dam wasn't there? Or does it not have an effect? Compared to the James and the Shenandoah, probably the answer would be yes but it doesn't totally make us immune from the big storms, you know? I mean, the new definitely blows out less than the James and the Shenandoah, but I mean, there's only so much if it can do, you know, if it, if it pours, they got to move water, you know, through the lake. So, I mean, it does protect us from floods to a certain extent, but it's not like we like never get blown out either, you know? David Williams. Uh, David, by the way, your crankbait is in the mail. I just uh, I just mailed it out today. Sorry, it's a month late. Um, Ethan, if someone wanted to go kayak fishing to the New River from the Richmond area, where would you say was a good spot to go for the first time? Oh, I'll add to that safety precautions because it is a different place, a different animal compared to like the James or the Shenandoah. Yeah, um, I would say what you should do is just really the DWR has a great write up on the new river and each stretch and kind of what to expect in each stretch, you know? So I'm, um, I always, you know, this time of year, there's, there's kind of some legitimacy to, to starting at the same spot that you end because you don't want to be fishing that fast, you know? So, I mean, depending on what time, type of kayak you have, maybe you put in and go upstream a little bit and float back. But, uh, if you want to do a full float trip, I'd say just really look at that DWR website and try to find a stretch that keeps you out of uh, class two plus rapids. Yeah, because I don't think the James or any of the rivers, honestly, maybe the Julieta, uh, but I'm not familiar with that, have class, that kind of class rapids. Like, it's such a rarity. Yeah, the James has a few up our way, you know, in the far upper James where we are. But uh, yeah, the, Jackson. The, new, the new has a lot more. You know, yeah. yeah. Be safe there, guys. All right. So then we got another really good question here. Let me make sure. All right. Barry. Oh, I Barry Sow Barry Sowers. So I hope I said that right. I can't read, apparently. With space being limited in a raft, how many rods would you recommend your clients bring? Uh, not that I'm known for bringing too many rods. Barry brings a lot of rods. I've fished with him before, but he, he has nice gear, so it just keeps the day of wear and tear off my rods. But uh, usually on a guide trip, I uh, used to bring five rods. That was like, I'd bring five rods, and then I snuck up to six rods. To, and then now I've snuck up to seven rods because I like bringing a seven, six heavy for the mag draft. So now I like, I bring seven rods. Usually if my clients bring rods, I leave some of my rods because I don't like having any more than seven. So my raft comfortably fits seven rods, I'll say. We didn't add up. Maybe you answered this and I just spaced out. What pound test line are you throwing that mag draft with? Because you're not hunting for 10 pound largemouth. So are you lighter? Uh, I probably should go 17, but I usually go 15. Jesus, um, you're brave. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we don't have too many of those like gnarly, woody laydowns. Um, yeah. And I like, I mean, the Mac draft does good and clear conditions here sometimes. So, yeah, I do 15. Um, that being said, I did break a Mac draft off last time I was out. But uh, I, whenever I break off, I just say the bite was probably a muskie and move on. That's how I feel better about myself. Phew. 
<laughs> got and then guys i know we have a ton of people on instagram watch right now if you guys want to ask a question you can and uh i'll answer it there's one right here from i fill in the blank five uh, again guys uh, instagram does not let me share to stream yard so i just have to read it out fill in the blank five recommendations on what <laughs> all right thank you uh recommendations on what thomas can do to upgrade from the sweaty gamer look well i did do my hair this time bud so i appreciate it uh, but I will always continue to get better with the way I look. Thank you, Phil. Great man. Uh, let's see. We got Austin here. Have you found the mag draft to work better in slower water or faster water? It all depends. Like I caught them this week in slower water. I mean, I pretty much think of the mag draft like it's a spinnerbait in my mind. So like I, I, kind of call the mag draft like a clear water spinnerbait. When the water's clear, I fish a mag draft almost instead of a spinnerbait. And then if it's dirty, I'll fish a spinnerbait. But uh, if it's early season, like now it's February, you know, if you were to be fishing a spinnerbait, you'd probably be really slow rolling it in the deeper, slower areas. So this time of year, you know, probably for the next few weeks, I fish it really slow. I mean, Really, like I have a five to five to one and I'm barely cranking on it, like just enough to get the tail to go. And then the more it gets towards the spawn, the more I'll start throwing it up shallow because those smallmouth are so different than largemouth when they spawn. They're just so territorial and aggressive that like when people, you know, obviously bed fishing for largemouth, they slow down, they get a plastic and they just like you know, go over and over. And I found that the best way to fish for smallmouth during the spawn is to have a moving bait and just cover a ton of ground. Cause those smallmouth are so aggressive on the bed and the ones that aren't very aggressive, usually it's not really worth slowing down and wasting your time with them. Usually hmm. I find that instead of slowing down and fishing for smallmouth during the spawn, I should just, go faster and cover more areas with a moving bait. So kind of the closer I get to the spawn, I'll start throwing that mag draft up shallow, working it a little faster. And that's when you'll see him come out of nowhere and tag it, you know, whereas this time of year, you know, I'm fishing it in six, seven foot runs, just painfully slow, but it still is really effective. Do you generally f have a lot of spawn, like bed fishing? Like, is that a, a long window of time or is that more of a, every now and again, you, you'll be able to have that opportunity? we don't really do much bed fishing. Like I said, I've just like, you know, I kind of know where the spawning areas are. And during the spawn, I try to hit as many of them as possible. And if we hit one and it's not just popping off, it's time to move to the next one, you know? And then, uh, I mean, just the sportsmen in me, smallmouth are just so yeah, awesome. And, and you know, I mean, a big smallmouth is like, 15 16 years old in the river you know so i just kind of in my mind if they're not gonna eat something in the first few casts you know move on and and let them create the next generation you know no that's so important and it's not like lake erie the st lawrence river way where you have that massive population and you have the ability to also just do it for a longer period of time you know, it's not like a lake either where you have a long i think it's easier probably on a lake than like the Shenandoah Upper Potomac to, to get into a good uh, smallmouth spawn bite. But again, that's just kind of like, that's just my opinion there. Uh, we got another one for Travis, uh, Travis Cyber here. Uh, does the water, does the water leave the new as fast as it does in the Doha? Seems like these past few years, we can get a big rain and with, and, and then within two days, it's all gone. So I guess he's talking really about flow rates. So yeah. I would say since the new is just a bigger system, the, it, the water doesn't recede as fast as it would in the Shenandoah. Um, if we get a big rain, it'll it'll hold high for probably longer than the Shenandoah. Um, our area is just so weird, kind of with all the steep mountains and valleys, and our weather is just so, so localized around here. So... It really, I have an app that has all the U.S. Geological Service stations in the whole country. And uh, it's just amazing kind of how localized the weather is. And there's a bunch of tributaries, you know, like I said, we cover about 70 miles of river. Wow. And there's probably 10 major tributaries in that section, you know, that all drain these 
steep mountain valleys, you know. And sometimes it'll rain like five inches in one valley and 20 miles down the road over a big mountain, it doesn't rain at all. So there's just one feeder creek that's like chocolate milk, whereas the rest of the river is all good. So it just, the new is just, you really got to know how to read your gauges, read the weather. But uh, I would say the new rises slower than the Shenandoah and it recedes slower than the Shenandoah. I think Logan echoes this point here. Logan has, yeah. there is a lot of feeder creeks below the dam that pour into the new and can really raise the water level. Yeah. Yeah. A Alabama bass situation. Um, is it a problem down there? I know that, that there's allegedly been spots caught on the new. Have What have you seen? Oh yeah. Uh, last year, I'd say like me and all our guides caught like five spots on the new. And wow. I mean, hundreds and, hundreds of fishing days um they're just full of them in Clater lake which yeah. it always kind of surprises me how just downstream we could not catch that many but uh no it is a problem i mean some of the r other rivers that i travel to and fish for fun on the east coast you know they have spot alabama spots and smallmouth and you catch just so many of those like hybrid mean mouth type fish, you know? And I mean, you catch some that like look almost like a small mouth, but I catch so many small mouth, you know, I'm like, no, like at some point there's been a spot in there, you know? And it just on the new river that I feel like has just such a good, genetics for smallmouth i feel like it would be really detrimental you know it would just kind of impurify the the gene pool a little bit but that being said those mean mouth hybrids are uh they're fun to catch well not really to go on too much of a tangent but i think everybody when they say mean mouth thinks it's like 50 percent spot 50 percent smallmouth you know but i mean it's like a family tree, you know? I mean, it's like there could be a fish that's one of its great grandparents was a spot, you know, and it's 90% smallmouth, but isn't quite all the way there, you know? Or, you know, I mean, they're just, there's, once they start interbreeding, you know, there's going to be fish from 1% spot, 99% smallmouth to 1% smallmouth, 99% spot, you know? So it just would throw on the new river, I think it would just throw everything out of whack. But uh, something I think we have in our favor is the new is just so crawfish based in forage and spotted bass, you know, are so bait fish oriented. Interesting. That I don't think they would like thrive here. And one of them, actually Logan, who keeps asking the questions, he's a guide for us. One of them he caught last year, it was just disgusting it was like looked like a snake almost it was like 16 inches long but it was just hardly ever i'd seen a fish so skinny and emaciated whereas all the smallmouth you catch on the new river are like so healthy looking you know that's weird so, yeah huh yeah how many guys do you have like in your organization i think you mentioned that uh earlier but I, um, I probably forgot. we have like a couple kind of full-time guides, myself included, and then a couple other part-time guides. So yeah, usually we run like kind of like two full-time people and three part-time people. And then we got a, we got a question here from uh, Mark Burke. Uh, what are the more hazardous areas you fish? Um, the, so as the new continues into West Virginia, it gets really hazardous. So if there's anybody that fishes the new in West Virginia watching, they're probably laughing at me like, oh man, you ain't doing nothing up there. But uh, in the 70 miles of river that we kind of cover with regularity, there's like four class three rapids. And one of them is a class three, four, depending on the water level. So, I mean, just, you know, a few little class ones and twos. And then every now and again, we go through a class three, but uh, it just, I mean, you always have to be a little careful, always on your A game. But, uh, you know, I've run them so many times now. It just <laughs> kind of comes naturally. But, yeah. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think the new river has the smallmouth record for Virginia. Do you think 
I mean, first off, do you think that record will ever be broken? And secondly, if it will be broken, will it be on the new? Um, I think it will be broken. I mean, I don't think records like that stand forever. I, I have, there's, I've seen confirmed accounts of people being within a pound of the current state record in the last few years on the new. So, uh, I mean, I think one day it's going to fall. I mean, I just, you know, just got to get it right. I mean, it kind of like I caught my six pound, two ounce on the new last spring. And I was like, man, this is huge. I can't imagine one that's like two pounds bigger than this, you know, but, uh, I'm sure it's in there. I'm sure it's in there. When you compare and contrast, when you got to go up to Lake Erie and fish for those, uh, how ner- how shy are the fish in the new comparatively? Because I would assume, again, not an individual that lives down there, that they're not really boat shy because they probably don't get as much pressure as like the Shenandoah, like the Upper James, like places like that. Because it feels like the new river is it, Jurassic Park in the middle of nowhere. Is that, yeah. how far off is that? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's certain areas that get a lot of pressure. There's areas that are kind of easy to access by kayak. And I have noticed that uh, the fish definitely spook in that in those areas. Like, for example, like there's one area that's really notorious, a lot of kayakers, and it is very conducive for topwater fishing in the summer. And I've noticed that you cannot get a fish to look at a whopper plopper up there anymore. I mean, it's like they go like, whoo, and even a walking bait, you know, they'll like, they won't hit it really. They'll like miss it almost on purpose. And uh, then last summer I found a bait on the website, a JDM bait, you know, and I got it and it was like the top water bite was back on at that spot after they acted so spooky around every top water bait. So, I mean, it's like the same as everything fish can get tuned up, but I mean, like I said, we cover a huge area of river, you know, I think kind of in my area between Blacksburg, Christiansburg and Radford, there's about a hundred thousand people. So, um, kind of the river in this area gets a little more pressure, but kind of the farther upstream you go for me in Blacksburg, there kind of gets to be a lot less people and a lot less, you know, people on the river. And uh, that's, I mean, that's kind of the areas where I usually catch my absolute biggest fish is where they wouldn't get a lot of pressure. But uh, to answer your question, like when we went to Lake Erie, I mean, we were fishing deep. We weren't like sight fishing by any means, but I mean, it seemed like to, to do really well, we needed to be throwing six pound leader. I mean, we were fishing really finessey, like, like Kitek three threes, drop shots, you know, the little, little mega bass jerk baits. Whereas on the new river, I mean, like I showed you earlier, I mean, I'm throwing like, like big football jigs and like half ounce hog collar spinner baits, you know, and mag drafts, you know, so I do think on the, the the new is a great fun place to power fish for smallmouth. You know, I, I I know there's a power fishing bite up north on the St. Lawrence and Erie at certain times, but the the springtime on the New River, it, if you're like a power fisherman for smallmouth, is just incredible. It, it that's so freaking interesting to me. Yeah, I mean. It, I've always been curious, like what makes these places set up the way they do. And I really think it comes down to clarity in the bait. Uh, and I think clarity is, is the number one thing. Uh, and it's interesting when you talk about pressure and it makes anglers adapt. Mm-hmm. And you, I think, had a big hand. If you guys didn't hear this, uh, since I mean, my channel has like tripled in size since the last time you came on. So you helped uh, Nolan Minor or, or vice versa with a interesting bait choice that potentially helped him out when he fished a Hobie series on the Susky. Uh, is that yeah. the spider? Yeah. The, uh, oh. well, it's a cicada, a cicada impersonation, but, uh, yeah. So we do fly fishing trips as well. Um, and kind of our specialty at our guide service that, that my predecessor, Britt Stoudemire kind of, well, he didn't come up with the technique, but he really put a lot of time and effort into refining it is fishing a big cicada bug and just dead sticking it. And 
Nolan had the tournament on the Susquehanna, and I had never really – I told him because the tournament was in late July or August, and I'm like, man, Nolan, to be honest, my fly clients catch bigger smallmouth than my spin clients do when the water is really low and clear in the summer. Like we catch bigger fish on our fly trips than our spin trips. And I just had never really found a good spinning rod substitute for that cicada bug fly that we fish on our fly fishing trips. And Nolan found it and uh, did super well at that time, won the tournament, you know, and uh, now there's none of them left. But uh, I still have a few. So if you want to watch Nolan's YouTube video of uh, fishing up on the Susquehanna and you want to fish with one of the few guys left in America that owns some evergreen gizmos, you can give me a call because that is a fun bite. It's a fun bite. Starting price for the pack is $2,000. Well, I got to I gotta throw out. Yeah, I got to throw out some shout outs to Nolan because he secured the bag for me for a couple. But uh Honestly, I was on an eBay auction that ended at 610 for one, and I won it, and it just made my mood so good this whole evening. And that's something I, that the reason I, I, I teed this off is you talked about hunting for a JDM topwater bait, which, yep. and it's, it's not about giving up the, I don't want to give up the bait, but it's more of like your mindset of like, they're off the, the whopper plopper. Cool. I need to find something different. Is that something that you're constantly doing this mindset of like, I'm going to go to the, the nether reaches of the internet that, and find different things? Yeah. So honest, I kind of mistold the story. I'm sure he's going to watch it. It was another one <laughs> of our guides, Randy, that found the bait that I spoke of earlier. So Randy, you found it. But uh, <laughs> it worked really well. But yeah, I just think you always got to be doing something a little different than everybody else. Um you know, for a few years for me, it was the mag draft, but I think the secret's kind of out on that now. Um, I mean, the secret has been out on that for largemouth fishing for a long time. I think the secret's getting out on smallmouth fishing for it. But uh, yeah, just you always got to be conscious of doing things a little bit differently, um, especially in areas you get a lot of pressure. I mean, there's like kind of, 10 like major floats that we rotate through and I kind of know these floats get a lot of pressure and I may have to do something different. And then these floats, I'm like almost the only person that fishes them, you know? So it's, it just, you kind of got to keep in that in your mind while you're fishing for sure. It makes, for, for, in my mind, it makes sense for a professional like Bassmaster guy to do it. Like Milliken who he spent six grand on like five swim baits and you know, he won a hundred thousand. For you, if you buy this JDM bait and let's say it's um, 200 bucks, great. But then you get Debbie on the boat and she yeets this thing into a tree. It's almost yeah. like with the with the mega bass thing. I know a lot of guys are like, I won't throw a mega bass because it costs so much to replace them. So how much does that come into your minds about like, I got to give them something different, but I got to be like cost effective here too. Yeah, well, I mean, I really truly like pride myself on, I want my clients to have the best gear. I want them to truly have the baits that I feel like will be the best for them. Um, so there's that, you know, I, I really try to give everybody a chance at throwing like the top of the line stuff, the stuff I think will work the best, you know, um, but, you know, at, at a point, you, you got to be cost effective, too. I mean, that's kind of like the the one of the differences between like the tube and the jig. Like I was saying, like in my you just go through so many jigs on the new river, you know, and maybe in a perfect world where everything was free. I would I would like throw this a lot more and the tube less. But you know, just with how many jigs you go through on the river, you know, you got to throw that tube because you'd be going through. I mean, it is when the tube bites, it's really on, you know, it's nothing to go through like 15 tubes a day. You know, and if you're going through 15, $6, $7 tungsten football jigs, you know, that's not feasible. But uh, any purple in your tubes? Oh, I have a bunch of different color tubes. Um, I kind of just put this one on. I, I like kind of these like kind of crawl looking patterns. 
Um, I really like black. I mean, black is just a staple. And then that's so weird. I like like a goby, like you're saying, like the green pumpkin with purple does well for me too. Yeah, guys. Uh, clearly, <coughs> Cole, I, know I saw you in chat. And like, I don't even have my damn Ned rigs because I usually have some shit here, guys. But I put it all in my boat because um, I have Barry in the chat here. He said something interesting, which is, you know, people underestimate, underestimate the size of a bait a smallmouth will eat. I, so my hypothesis on this and Barry, it could be completely wrong, but it, it's also dependent on the body of water. I have tried bigger baits on the Shenandoah and the Upper Potomac. Granted, maybe it's the wrong time of year, but the most cash I won this year was throwing the micro TRD in the micro tiny tube on the Upper Potomac and the Shenandoah. I what don't time know why. of year was that? Between June and late August. Well, that's kind of when they have the slowest metabolism of the whole year. So Boom. that that would be a bait that would catch them kind of then, you know, when they have a huge metabolism this time of year because they're trying to gain a pound before they spawn in April, you know, you're not going to have the same level of, I mean, not saying you won't catch them on like a micro bait like that, but you'll have better success on a bigger bait. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Cause I've always thought it's like, it's also like forage dependent. Like you got lobsters. I know the Susky's got these massive shiner, but that is interesting, and I got to actually start trying that. And that's it goes with Curtis Cole here. It says, uh, ever try a jackhammer bladed jig or jackhammers oh, yeah. in general? I throw a jackhammer a lot. Um, conditions, I mean, like some of my favorite days this time of year are just the nasty, muddy days. The days when the water's high and muddy, and that's when I like throwing a jackhammer a lot. And what it does is, one, it just like – really concentrates the fish i mean when it's like really high there's only a few places that the fish can get out of the current and they need to get out of the current you know so it really compacts the fish into the eddies and we were talking about earlier about just how old a big smallmouth is like like they're old and they are smart you know and i think i think think it is really hard to catch like the biggest fish on any day the water's totally clear like my biggest smallmouth catches have come i mean not in like chocolate milk dirty water but some of them have but in at least water that's a little turned up hmm. yeah so uh i really like throwing that jackhammer when the water gets muddy i i'm pretty much the only ones i have are red and chartreuse because i don't throw it that much in clear water but uh yeah some of the biggest biggest fish we catch year after year are in some days when the water's pretty darn stained fit so uh guys i'm over on instagram sorry i i was listening in like you guys and i was not uh, avoiding my chat here we have have we've had like close to between 40 and 60 people between instagram facebook and youtube bouncing questions so i want to make sure we get them all answered before we cut off tonight uh, let's see. Uh, apparently my wife is arguing with somebody on Instagram. That's fantastic. Uh, we got a good question here. Um, I, I'm a little too timid to ask, but, uh, what are, what are you looking for when you're throwing a Ned rig and a tube? What type of setup? And that is from Phil in the blank five. So yeah, what's so, your setup for that? Um, well, kind of the tube is like my winter and pre-spawn bait. Um, it's like my cold water bait. And then I go to a Ned rig pretty much as soon as the spawn ends. And I fish the Ned rig all throughout the summer with the exception being if the water is really high and stained in the summer, then I go back to a tube. But uh, as far as tackle, um, I usually on a guide trip, I bring one medium light spinning rod. Um, in the summer, I go to two medium light spinning rods. And then two medium spinning rods, a medium heavy, and then a medium heavy bait caster and a heavy bait caster. But usually I throw probably the Ned rig on that medium light spinning rod and the tube because I usually fish a tube on either a quarter or three eighths that go on the medium spinning rod. But uh, I do 10 pound Power Pro to 12 pound fluorocarbon leader except sometimes with the tube i'll go up to 15 just because it's hopping through those rocks and all that gnarly cover on the bottom i think that's so important when you talk about about line size and the rod load um 
that's something I've experimented more with when I was throwing the micro baits is getting a longer rod, a medium going. I was experimenting when I was throwing those micro TRDs when I got on that thing in the summertime. You know, I I went I went to an ultralight first. That was a retarded. Shouldn't have done that. Then I went to a medium, and then I finally went to a medium light, which was my setup because of the load of the rod and the size of the hook. And I really think when you're getting into the ends of the spectrum, the mag drafts, the glide baits, or the hair jigs, the tiny tubes and stuff is so important to make sure you match the line, the rod, the hook. So the whole thing works as a system. I mean, yeah, honestly, gone. in the summertime, like outside of the pre-spawn, if I could only have one rod, it'd probably be a medium light. Just, oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, so many, you can throw so many baits on that medium light, like a wacky, a fluke, a Ned, a little top water, like you were saying. Um, yeah, that medium light, definitely. That's kind of why I go to, I have one of them in my arsenal in the winter and pre-spawn. And then I go to two in the summer. Dude, this is awesome stuff. All right. We got two more questions here, guys. And then I'm going to, I'm going to be shutting this down. Uh, I don't want to be here for, for six hours. This guy's a working man. He's got things to do. We got Ricky Falk. This is more of a statement than a question. Uh, Cotton Cordell, Smoking Joe, the small one. If, if I float, that's all I fish on the Shenandoah. And then we got Barry again. Uh, they'll smash a six inch swim bait from early spring to early summer here on the Broad River in South Carolina. Do you, do you think they're just doing that out of hate or do you think they think that's another small mouth they're eating? <laughs> I, around the spawn, they do it out of hate. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it's, yeah, they're so, they're trying to, to, to find their partner and find their spawning area. And they don't like a big six inch bait going through there. But I mean, like I said, I mean, it's February and I've, I mean, I've caught, I've caught a bunch of fish on the mag draft already this year and it's February and they can't really be eating it out of being territorial this time, this early in the year, you know? So I think it's a little bit of combination. So how busy are you guide wise? Do you have time for more clients? Oh, well, we could always try to fit you in, give us a call and we'll call. I mean, I know I start the first week of March and I have a very daunting schedule from the, from the first week of March to, uh, the end of April, but we, uh, we're looking to add some guides to our team. Um, so I think we will have a little more availability this spring. And if you're interested in guiding and in the area, definitely also reach out. So do you, do I, I don't, I definitely, I didn't think I asked this question I was like, so are you the one that now, are you one of the senior guides where you do more of the booking and stuff? And are you dialing back on how many trips you do and doing more of the management stuff? Are you still, out there I'm doing like the, the kind of doing the management stuff without dialing back how many tricks I do. So if you Damn, uh, contact us, you'll probably get me most of the time, unless I'm like out on the river. I don't take calls while I'm on the river ever, but uh, yeah, if you reach out to me either through the business number or personally on Instagram or anything, I'll get you hooked up with a trip and uh, it's always a good day. Like I said, we really, pride ourselves on putting our clients in the best position to catch the biggest smallmouth of their life. I mean, we, if you're the type of person that wants to just kind of fish and float, you know, just have a fun day on the river that we totally get that. And we do that too, you know, but if you are wanting to stay here in the Southeast and catch the biggest smallmouth of your life, I truly like that is what we pride ourselves on here at New River Outdoor Company. How long are you going to try to burn the candle at both ends before you like dial it back just a well, little I'm bit? I'm young, man. I'm only 24. I got, I got a lot of <laughs> gas in the tank, man. Yeah, yeah but you got to like get, get that worth like balance too, man. You're married. You're getting married now. Getting I mean, married come on. later this year. Yeah. So I, honestly, my work life balance is uh, kind of. I mean, I I do a couple like odd jobs, side jobs over the kind of December, January, but. I'm fishing a ton in February, but honestly, kind of December, January are my unwind months. But, you know, I do the fishing shows in January, too. So it's always mm -hmm. always a few things going on, you know. And, and then one thing I want to make sure I, I mentioned my notes. You guys also do you I think this is the part you manage. Uh, you do cabin rentals, too. Yes. And what that's a huge that? part. So okay. I'll give our little business spiel. We got just a plus amenities. You can come stay at Walker Creek Retreat. Um, great cabins, five-star ratings on Airbnb, VRBO, 
But if you book a fishing trip, you know, we will also hook you up. We do package deals. Our most popular is called the Spring Trophy Package. And that's for two people to come fishing for two days and spend two nights in our cabins for only $13.50, which comes out to like $675 a person. But that's like far and away our most popular deal is that two days fishing, two nights in our cabin. And then, guys, as always, link to everything is already in the episode description, but I also just dropped it in chat, too, for everyone that, that's listening, uh, because chat function doesn't like links. I just put the phone number and email, but again, already in the episode description is a link to everything, so you can go check him out. Uh, as always with these live streams, guys, I'll be taking it down later tonight, and then everything gets re-uploaded back to YouTube tomorrow for uh, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Just want to make sure the audio and everything was good and there's no issues, so uh, Mr. YouTube overlords, don't get mad at me for things. Um, um, yeah, Ethan, again, I know you're a busy man. I appreciate the time that you were able to give me this evening. Is there anything else that we need to make sure we cover? Or is there anything else that you'd like to promote? No, just, I mean, if you've been on the fence about it, come down, stay at our cabins, come fishing. It's a fun bite the whole year. Like, I mean, we covered what we cover in this episode, a lot of winter fishing, a lot of yep. spring fishing, but also like come in the summer and fish that really unique bug bite you know or june usually is the best month for ploppers and walking baits and stuff so if that's your style you know june is a great month so just you know give us a contact and ask questions and we'll kind of steer you in the right direction for whatever experience we think would be best for you we got one more question and then we'll hang up this guy i got i gotta give it to him uh we got fear shack fishing no more questions after this one i pinky swear uh i know this is late but what size rod are you throwing the mag draft on thanks um it's a seven six medium heavy but it's a really stout medium heavy it's like a carolina rig rod boom there you go and then guys i'm definitely going to try to get ethan on again um for the summertime i know in richmond everyone said like i call myself the dmv which means i got to cover all these waters like throughout the season so we'll definitely get somebody back on to cover the new river as we evolve into the next season but again guys we are done here uh like subscribe to the channel uh it really helps out in the algorithm and we'll see you guys next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will